Hello once again, this is Pastor Shane with Waikia Baptist Bible Church and this is the sermon for May 24th, 2020. Hope that you're joining us as part of the worship service. If you're not, then I'm still glad that you're here. But I do encourage using the playlist at 10 a.m. on Sunday morning so even though that we are apart from one another, we can still worship together. Uh, but even if you're not worshiping at the same time as most others, that's okay. I hope that you find encouragement through this, through all the other content that we have. And I pray that the Holy Spirit works through these sermons, works through the catch-ups, works through whatever other Bible studies we have online. Because we desire to keep you connected with one another and to God's Word. So get ready, grab your Bible, and as we prepare to get into God's Word. But join with me in a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for today and allowing us to come together and study your word. We ask your blessing upon it and pray that uh, we come to you so that we can be changed. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So some exciting news uh, came down in Hawaii this past week. Uh, you know, it was handed down from Governor Ige. We've been downgraded to act with care. It started off with stay at home, then went to safer at home. And now we're at the act with care phase and we're looking to reopen different parts of society. Some parts of society have already opened. Churches are going to be included in this phase. And we're, while we're still waiting on Mayor Kim to provide gu guidelines for our Hawaii County, uh, just so you know, this is exciting, but Waikia Baptist Bible Church is not planning on reopening right away because of uh, multiple factors. Uh, two of the most prevalent being the demographics of our church. We're just too darn good looking. No, no, no. We're, we have an older congregation and we really don't want to put anyone at risk. But also the fact that we use shared space with the YMCA. Understand that we do look forward to getting back together in some form. And we, we pray for good reports as society reopens around the state, around the nation, around the world. And please know that the leadership is looking forward to uh, getting back together with everyone again and meeting regularly. And we're making plans to do so, but in a responsible manner. So in the meantime, praise God. That he provides us, us with ways to stay connected. And at the same time, pray for us as your leaders. Pray for our leaders in the state, our leaders in the nation, leaders all over who are making many difficult decisions during this time. And during the process, also pray that people won't get crazy. You know, I've already heard stories about some ridiculous people. And when I say ridiculous, it's not really in a ha-ha manner. But, you know, it's just people are kind of crazy in a lot of different ways. You know, I've heard about people in Michigan shooting a security guard because the security guard told them that they had to wear a mask before entering the store. And so they shot him to death. And it's so disappointing to hear about things like this and hear about it happening anywhere. But, you know, if we think that we're completely immune here in Hilo, know that there's already reports of, you know, some crazies out there. Liusa shared with me this past week that he had to call the cops on people uh, at Home Depot because they were getting out of hand. You would think that Liusa would have been able to handle Earl in a different way, but just instead of just calling the cops on him. No, no, no. I'm just kidding. Uh, it wasn't Earl, although Liusa did not mention any name, so, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't Earl. But yeah, you hear about these kinds of things. You know, I saw a video on Facebook of a lady yelling racial slurs and swearing at security in our very own Walmart parking lot. You know, I hope that I don't see any videos of you folks like that uh, floating around. Because imagine what people would say about you. What they would say about our church. What they would say about Christians in general if you acted like that. You know, as believers living for the Lord, we need to live above reproach in this world. And we're going to read a passage today from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11-17 through 17, that instructs believers on just how to live this kind of life. So 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11-17. through 17. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul, Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as a supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Live as free men. 
but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Honor the King. So we are continuing our series through 1 Peter. Uh, you can check out the previous sermons that have been posted on the channel. I've even created a playlist to make it easier to get to them. You don't have to sift through all of the different videos that we have. If you need to know what playlist it is, you can go to view all the different playlists. It's the one named Sermons, 1 Peter. I think it's pretty self-explanatory, but since I just explained it, maybe it's not. But I chose to go through 1 Peter for a few different reasons. Now, firstly, it is one of my favorite books in the Bible and is written by one of my favorite Bible characters. You know, I find Peter quite relatable because you know, he's often acting rashly, getting himself into awkward situations. I'm like, I can relate. I know how that is. And But knowing who Peter is, it's almost ironic that this same Peter from the, all those gospel stories is now telling the people kind of to do just the opposite of what he did in his younger days. He's telling them to make sure to live an upstanding life. Live an upstanding life. You know, this is true for them back then. And it's still true for believers today. And, you know, this has always amazed me how applications are st still apply across time, across cultures, across space. But what's also amazing is that same Peter telling the people to live these quiet and submissive lives. And you know, what makes this even more amazing is the society that the readers were living in. And this is another reason why I chose to go through this series at this time, because they were living in an uncertain situation, somewhat similar to what we're going through. And yet, in these verses, Peter still urged them to live upstanding lives in a society that often mistreated them and persecuted Christians. Remember that they were under Nero's rule at this time. And Nero's rule would break really bad. And it would lead to Peter's death, along with so many other believers. And so you look at it, and it's certainly worse than the situation that we're dealing with. So these verses would certainly still be valid for us today in our tamer situation. So let's look into what these verses say and how to go about living. Uh, begins, Peter begins by addressing dear friends. Literally, this dear friends is can be translated as beloved. It's the Greek word agapito. You can probably hear agape love in there. Uh, the readers are loved by the author. They are beloved by Peter. But more importantly, and most importantly, they are beloved by God. Peter is urging these beloved readers to abstain from sinful desires, which he says, war against your soul. Uh, this word sinful desires, it literally translates as desires of the flesh. In the New Testament, you often have the flesh, the world, worldly things, versus the spirit. And these two uh, contradict each other. And so what Peter is saying is, don't give in to these worldly temptations, because it's only going to lead to our destruction. You know, that's what the war metaphor emphasizes. You know, these sinful desires are only seeking to leave you in ruin. You may feel good in the short term giving in to these temptations, but they will not sustain you or build you toward anything in the future. You know, and we are working towards something greater. You know, we're reminded of this when Peter says, uh, calls them strangers and aliens. These are both words that have been used in the past and both words that have been used to emphasize that we are just passing through this world. Our ultimate citizenship lies in heaven. So we're not supposed to give in to the flesh, give in to the sin which belong to this world because we don't belong to this world. You know, at the same time, because of this, the world is not always going to accept us and will even mistreat us along the way. The question is, how are we going to respond? And so Peter goes on to talk about this in verse 12. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits. You know, even though the world may persecute you, even though the uh, sinful desires of the world war against us, it's not about retaliating. Instead, we are called to live an upstanding life, 
not give in to temptation, live above reproach, live such good lives, and good in the sense, not just of content, which is very important, we need to do, but also, you know, it appears good, it's pleasing to the eye, pleasing to other people, you know, no matter what, pagans, and this word pagans is literally the word nations, it's the Greek word ethne, where we get ethnic from, in the Old Testament, it's translated as Gentiles, those who do not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, those who do not follow God, but no matter what, these people are watching, now, we know we may not want people watching us, but that's just the way it is. And the fact is that we need to look good. We need to look good for, for God and as his witnesses. We're, they're often watching us to find any reason to accuse us and cut us down. And what Peter is saying here, don't give them any reason. And this was certainly pertinent to the first century Christians. They understood this perfectly because they came under attack for a number of different things. Here are just a few examples. You know, they were accused of participating in orgies, you know, based on the worship services that emphasized love. And they talked about having a love feast, which was a meal uh, during or after their worship service. They were accused of cannibalism because of the Lord's Supper, you know, partaking in Christ's body and blood. We know that they weren't actually uh, eating the body and blood, but they were, that's what they were accused of. They were accused of breaking up families and disrupting parts of society. These are all twisting the truth and creating a narrative to accuse believers of wrongdoing. You know, those outside of the church are always looking for ways to bring down believers, to knock us off our high horses. We shouldn't be on high horses at all, but that's what they're looking to do. That's, what, that's how they think of us. And what Peter is saying is, don't give them any basis, any ammunition for their accusations. Live an upstanding life in the sight of others, basically to shut them up. Well, nah, not really, but kind of. But the main point of this is we are witnesses to them. And so we don't just want to shut them up, but we don't want to give them any basis for the accusations. We want to be witnesses to them. We are the way that they can see God through our good deeds. Hopefully it does shut them up in this manner, but more than that, helps them to realize what the real truth is, to realize that we're not just putting up a facade, but serving and glorifying the one true God. And we're doing this that they may glorify God as well, as Peter says, on the day he visits. And this is not a reference to the second coming because it's going to be too late by that time. But it's referring to the day that, you know, some of these pagans, Turn, realize their, the error of their ways, and accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. And the Holy Spirit visits them. That's what it's talking about, that they may find salvation. And our lives, if lived properly, have the power to do that. And so Peter goes on to further describe how to live this kind of life. Submit yourselves, for the Lord's sake, to every authority instituted among men. Let me first point out, the basis for this command. You know, and it's certainly a command. It's formed as an imperative. The basis for this command is for the Lord's sake. It can be really easy to read over that part. Submit yourselves to every authority. But no, we have to realize that it's for the Lord's sake. We ultimately serve the Lord. Jesus is the one who has set us free through his perfect sacrifice. But that doesn't mean that we're free to just go do whatever we want, but we are free to live for him. And part of living for him means submitting to every authority instituted among men. You know, men have instituted and created these governments and authorities, so we acknowledge them. But we also acknowledge that they're not perfect. No matter, but no matter how broken the authority we are living in may seem, we still need to submit to them. You know, it's really interesting to be going over these verses now because of the times that we're living in. You know, at the beginning of the pandemic up until now, some pastor said, no, you know, we, we don't need to listen to the government. Uh, some were saying, yeah, we're going to follow quarantine, but not because the government said so. We need to hold on to our rights. Others have been 
flagrantly defiant by holding large church services regardless of whatever guidelines are passed down, citing Hebrews 10.25, which says, let us not give up meeting together. You know, a pastor friend of mine posted on Facebook this past week, quoting John MacArthur, who is a well-respected preacher and scholar. It's kind of a long quote, but it's very pertinent, and he says it very eloquently. So I'm, I'm just going to read what MacArthur says. Yeah, let me make very clear this question, because it keeps coming up. If the government told us not to meet because Christianity was against the law, if the government told us not to meet because we would be punished, fine for our religion and our religious convictions, we would have no option but to meet anyway. And that takes you to the fifth chapter of Acts, where the leaders of Israel said to the apostles, Stop preaching. And Peter's response was very simple. He said, You judge whether we obey God or men. Then we, he went right out and preached. If the government tells us to stop worshiping, stop preaching, stop communicating the gospel, we don't stop. We obey God rather than men. We don't start a revolution about that. The apostles didn't do that. If they put us in jail, we go to jail and we have a jail ministry. Like the Apostle Paul said, my being in jail has fallen out to the furtherance of the gospel. If they were persecuted, they were faithful to proclaim the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, even if it took them to jail. And that's been the pattern of true Christianity through all the centuries. But this, and he's referring to quarantine guidelines, is not that. Might become that in the future. Might be overtones of that with some politicians. But this is the government saying, please do this for the protection of this society. This is for the greater societal good. That's their objective. That is not the persecution of Christianity. This is saying, behave this way so that people don't become ill and die. I mean, what should mark Christians is mercy, compassion, love, kindness, sacrifice. How are you doing that if you flaunt the fact that you're going to meet and essentially you're saying, we disregard the public safety issue? You really don't want to say that. That does not help the gospel cause. End quote. It's kind of talking about exactly what these verses are saying. To live upstanding lives. In regards to Hebrew 10.25 that I quoted, so don't stop meeting together, we have not stopped meeting together. The guidelines are not forcing us to stop meeting or to denounce God. We are still meeting right here. We're still meeting on Zoom at different times. We're still worshiping together and studying God's word together. All the while, we are still submitting to these different guidelines in order to be good witnesses and live upstanding lives. We look forward to when we can physically gather again. I know I do, and I know so many people have expressed that. But we want to do it properly. We want to do it respectfully. We want to do it in a way that is healthy for members and healthy for our witness to the community. This is what God wills. And it's always about putting God first. But we need to be willing to place ourselves under government, even if we disagree with it at times. You know, whether to the king as the supreme authority, or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right. The king would have referred to the emperor at that time, and he was basically the highest authority. And he's talking about the highest authority all the way down to local leaders. Um, and we also know that they are not perfect at any level. But we are still told to submit. The reason being is they've been put in place for order and to prevent anarchy. You know, it says that's the whole idea of punishing those who do wrong, commending those who do right. They may not always do so perfectly, but that's part of the fallen world that we live in. It doesn't change our responsibility to live upright lives, in part by being good citizens. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. You know, once again, this is the same as what we discussed as we were going through in verse 12. Do good to shut people up, in so many words. But make sure you're not smug about being right, because that would defeat the whole purpose. Don't be like, yeah, I'm right, you're wrong. That's not the purpose we discussed. It should be to get foolish people, and probably don't call them foolish people either, but these are literally people who do not know better. Our purpose should be to get them to see the truth of the Lord. That is God's will, to bring people to know Him through salvation in Jesus Christ, whom they can see in us, and who God wants them to see, wants to see in us. When we live upstanding lives, doing God's will 
by showing the truth and leading them to salvation. That's what God desires. And that's what it means to live as free men. But do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Jesus has set his people free. We need to live as free men and women. Now this can be misconstrued to mean that we can do whatever we want, but that's an abuse of grace and that's not what this is talking about. Yes, we are forgiven for all of our sins, past, present, and future, but that is not an excuse to go out and just sin willy-nilly. We need to live as servants of God. You know, this word servant can also be translated as slave. Slaves of God, and that may not sound nice, but the fact is we're going to be a slave to something. We can only serve one master, and we're, we are not our own master. We either are slave to sinful desires that desire to s destroy you, or we're slave to God, who provides eternal life. Live as free men, and choose to submit to authorities, knowing that we are serving God as His witnesses in His community. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Honor the king. Now the first and last verbs, show proper respect and honor. These are actually the exact same Greek word, timao. And it shows that everyone deserves respect. And that's what we should always give. From the king all the way down to the homeless guy you find down the beach. Now it's not a slight to the highest authority. But it's simply a recognition of humanity in every individual. And it goes a step further when it talks about our relationship with other believers. Love the brotherhood. Cherish them. Cherish them with agape love. Loving them unconditionally. And fear God. You know, only God deserves our fear. Not even the king. Because nothing else in this world can truly harm us. God is higher than any earthly power any king, any institution. He's the one that we serve. He's the one we live for. He's the one we fear. In order to live for him, we have been given instructions through his word. And it may seem restrictive at times, but really, his word is life-giving and freeing for all who would follow him. You know, sections like today's passage show us how we can live upstanding lives. And God is calling you to live a life above reproach in this world. So you can be his witness. You know, even though we are aliens and strangers in this world who are living for eternity, we still have a purpose here. You can make God known in this world through the way you behave and go about your life. You know, it doesn't matter what happens with all the rest of the world around you. You live for the Lord. So how can you live for the Lord, especially during these times? Two things today. First, be courteous. Be courteous. Now, you would think that this would be common sense, but common sense seems to be getting more and more uncommon as we move along. You know, honestly, you should have learned this in kindergarten or preschool, but you may be thinking, oh, that was so long ago. I can't remember last week's sermon. How do you expect me to remember lessons from decades ago? The problem is not that we don't remember. Oftentimes we do remember them. But sometimes we just choose to ignore them and give in to the sin, give in to the flesh. You know, especially as believers, we need to extend common or uncommon courtesy, especially during this time. People are on edge for many different reasons. Maybe they've been cooped up for too long, you know, they're stressed out with everything that's happening. Maybe they can't find groceries. Maybe they've been using junk toilet paper. I don't know what it is, but people are on edge. Don't give anyone a reason to call the cops on you for flipping out at Home Depot. Lisa proved that he's good. he'll do that. Don't give anyone a reason to pull out their phone and record you and post it online about your crazy rants. Now, and I know those two are kind of extreme circumstances, but even in the smaller things of life, be courteous. You know, you don't want to ruin your witness for a moment of fleeting pleasure. Don't give anyone excuse to hate on God. You know, like it or not, you are God's ambassadors in this world. And you have to behave. You should behave. You need to be courteous. Instead, give people a reason 
to see that you are different and that God is different. You know, our memory verse today is from 1 Peter 2.17. Show proper respect to everyone. Just that first part. 1 Peter 2.17. Show proper respect to everyone. Like I said, I keep it short because I want you to just be able to memorize it. Something that you can run through your head throughout the week. And that's my challenge for you. Keep reminding yourself throughout the week to be courteous, to show proper respect to everyone. And do this for the Lord's sake. You know, reminding yourself of this will help you when someone maybe cuts you off in traffic or gets a little bit too close to you when you're at the store. You know, it may even help you when you're at home, when someone says or does the wrong thing. You know, this challenge, now make sure that you know that this challenge is meant for you it's not meant for you to tell someone else, hey, remember what Pastor Shane challenged you? No, you can only control yourself. You know, it's not always easy to be courteous and kind. But if you keep reminding yourself, you'll be able to recall those lessons from kindergarten or today's sermon. And you can be a good witness for the Lord. Be courteous. And second, look to God for encouragement. Look to God for encouragement. It can be tiresome at times to be courteous all the time. Uh, not just because it's not always easy to fight temptation, but because sometimes people don't seem to appreciate the effort that you put in. They may even pay you back with rudeness or anger or attitude. Like I said, people are on edge right now. Uh, but it, sometimes it gets you to wonder, why do we even bother going through all of this? I get this way at times. You know, I talked about it during the midweek sermon this past Wednesday. I needed encouragement last week. The thing is, we're not always going to find encouragement from things of the world and people of the world. And the thing is, we can't look there and we shouldn't look there. They are not your source of significance. You do not serve them. So they're not the ones that you're trying to please. You know, this passage says submit to them, not serve authorities. We only serve the Lord. So we seek his approval. Ignore the negativity of the world. Come back to God who will show you what's good, who will show you what's right. Yes, there will be times where he has to discipline you, but that's not a bad thing. It shows that he loves you. He is always providing you with direction, and he wants to continue to provide you with encouragement to keep moving forward in him. You know, if you are waiting for the world to provide you with positive feedback, you could be waiting a long time. But know that when you live a proper and upstanding life, God will encourage you. If you're feeling down, ask Him for that encouragement. He'll provide it. You know, maybe He'll send you someone to say or do something out of the ordinary to just bring that encouragement into your life. Maybe He'll provide you with a sense of peace and joy through your prayers, through your devotions, through your Bible studies. You know, those help keep you connected with God so that you are in a position that you can be encouraged by Him. You know, maybe He'll just open your eyes to things that are already happening around you that you didn't realize He's already at work. God is doing amazing things all around you. Sometimes it just takes a matter of us opening our eyes to be encouraged. Recognize this. Look to Him for encouragement. Now these verses and my suggestions for applications do not promote any kind of works-based salvation. You, know, you cannot work your way to heaven because there is not enough courtesy or good in you or in the entire world to overcome sin. And the reason why is we need to be perfect to get to heaven. We need to be perfect to be with the Lord. And who's perfect? Put down your hands. You're not. It's impossible to be perfect on your own. But Jesus did what was impossible for us. He lived the perfect life. He died on the cross and he was resurrected three days later. And he did this so that we can share in his perfection and be forgiven of all of our sins. We are never going to be good enough for heaven on our own. But we can be forgiven and washed clean through Jesus Christ. You just need to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior to receive this forgiveness. The choice is up to you. You know, if you've never done this before and you'd like to do this, pray this short prayer with me. 
Pray this prayer with me right now. Just repeat after me. Jesus, I admit that I am a sinner in need of forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins. I confess you as my Lord and Savior. Amen. If you said this prayer, you are now a born-again Christian. Praise the Lord. Share this with me. I would love to hear this. Share this with other Christians that you know so that we can celebrate with you. God has set you on the right path to live your life. To live your life in, as an upstanding life and an outstanding life. Thank you for joining me today. I hope you have been blessed by God's word.